Good afternoon, friends. Stephen and Yana Benoon here on Israeli News Live. Uh, it is the Stephen Yana chat. We're doing this one pre-recorded. Kind of curious to see what's the difference between live and pre-records as far as views. So definitely, if you like the video, click on the thumbs up button there. Make, give a like to it there. Share it with your friends anywhere and everywhere you possibly can. Uh, we Today is September the 16th, 2024, so we're going to get right into it. So I'm going to turn this over to my navigator here, and uh, or she's the pilot. <laughs> no, she's the, I'm the navigator, okay. she's the pilot. Okay. All right, let's oh, go. Boy. All right, well, <clears throat> thanks for watching, and um, last time when we had our chat, Steve, we ended with talking about regrets. We have regrets, yes. you and I, and... Um, it's part of life to have regrets. People make mistakes. And when we were Zionists uh, and made so many trips to Israel, with all of our heart and mind, we believed things that we believed. So we did them because of intent of helping the Jewish people come to Messiah, Jesus. But we looked at the Bible with the lens of, Schofield Christianity. So I came just out of previous, I would, what I call is cult, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and then I came to Christ. I had this beautiful being born again experience where I met Christ. You witnessed it. Yes, I did. And it was amazing. It's, it's unspeakable. That's how amazing that was when it hit me that all these years I've been listening to elders and I was... Uh, working for my salvation, going house to house offering magazines that some uh, men printed in Brooklyn, New York, right? And I was under the scare of elders, and I even experienced it to the point, Steve, where I went to a uh, religious court. I mean, they had a religious court with me, three elders and me alone in a room. It was a, a terrifying experience, actually. Okay, and I never really talked about it because I don't want to hurt uh, people who are in, in this cult, but it's a very debilitating experience, actually, what I went through. But the most beautiful thing is when in 2010, I came out. It was August 2010 when I had my experience with Christ. Well, needless to say, I lost whole family because yes. a lot of big portion of my family on my mom's side are in that religion. So I was basically looked at apostate. Uh, they looked at me as an apostate and we lost communication and everything. So, but I would never uh, exchange it for Christ that I found that day. And it was almost like a overnight experience, Steve. I just came to Jesus. So what do you do? You go to churches from one church to the next, to the next, to the next, right? I even got rebaptized in a very good non-denominational church in Fort Myers, Florida. It was Brother Calvert. He was the pastor of a local church. and uh, he, Sun, Sunshine, isn't yes, it? Yes, right? he, he rebaptized me and he had me in front of the whole group of Christians to speak my experience, how I came to Jesus. It was amazing. But then, of course, I was married to my husband and he was Zionist and um, he wore kippa, he wore tzitzi. So uh, he was kind of explaining to me Schofield Christianity and we went to churches with Schofield Christianity and it was like a long time ago, by the way, 2010. So uh, you started it to kind of stir me. I, want, I, was, I wanted to redo all of the threads of Watchtower and learn how Bible should be interpreted. And unfortunately, I went into we went Schofield. Into one to the next, <laughs> From right? one wrong to the next wrong. And that might be your experience too in your life. As you go through life, you will find out. So when we are talking about brothers and sisters that are in a Schofield Christianity, they are in a stage of life where that's where they are stuck. And we need to help them to get unstuck, right? Yes, that's exactly because right. Then, of course, I went and you were my leader, you know, leading me into Zionist Christianity. And that's what I started to believe with all my heart. And that's when we entered ministry and you entered ministry. I entered with you as you are by your side. And we decided to, well, let's go. You used to live in Israel, so let's go back to Israel. 
Now, we were all happy reunited in Christ because the Christ is still there. The, the Christ that you feel within your heart is still there. It's just the lens, yes. the, the reading glasses that you use, right? That's, this, this is the lens that you put on and you interpret a biblical teachings through certain lens. Yes. So we went to Israel and it was there in Israel where we started to see things. I started to look at things. And especially when I started to uh, kind of embrace that part of me from my family side, this Jewish part, right? And I wanted to know Torah. I so wanted to know everything. So I started to study, read the Old Testament and uh, learn about Jewish traditions. We were doing Sabbath. Many of you remember, we were doing weekly Sabbath. I used to bake challah and prepare a beautiful table. My daughter was tiny, small, and we were uh, lighting Sabbath candles. And so that was like a, and it was a beautiful time of my life, I would say. But when we were in Israel, we started to know these things that are happening. And especially, um, we believed with all of our heart that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. I believe we made a video, Steve, that we are going to Israel and we needed your support and we had overwhelming response. And this is what we said, the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel. Yes. And we, we actually did a video asking the, the listeners that we had at the time those of you that stand with Israel unconditionally. Yes. Right? Stand with Israel unconditionally. Thanks for reminding me. That was the video. No matter what Israel did, and it we didn't matter. And we published that video. Yes. I think it's still probably still there to this day. You yeah. know? Wow. And I don't, the reason why I don't take yeah. stuff like that down yeah. Just, is because regardless, I mean, do you not realize that our Heavenly Father has recorded every inc incident in our life? You know? That's so right. It's still to show, yes, we were like this at one time, but we moved. To a different place. Yes, yeah, something happens because we are growing, spiritually growing all the time. So when we were in Israel, uh, we started to notice it's not really democracy. I mean, there were areas where uh, Arab people couldn't go. There were streets where they couldn't go, right? Uh, there were, when we were looking for a place to live, they were literally places to live that they would not rent to Arabs. It wasn't yes. like here in America that everybody, you know, yeah. you have equal well, there, rights. There's places right? that if you're a Christian, you weren't allowed to live yes. either. Right. And then I started noticing how these rabbis that we are learning from, because I started to study Torah and we started embracing Talmud too, because we wanted to know their traditions, the, you know, 613 laws. We want to know about them. So me being this bookworm I am, of course, I started to read everything. I wanted to know everything. We are then an institute of biblical research. Let's research, you know, everything. Christ must be hidden somewhere there. And let's help these Jews to see Christ. That was our ultimate goal. Yes. But we wanted to kind of learn about what their Talmud teaches, what their Zohar teaches, right? We were open at the time. Yes. So, yes. And it's a good thing. In a way, because and you were very loved by Gershon Solomon. I was, I was. If you remember you the picture took of the basket. first sheaf offering. Yes. Yana actually went. We went with Gershon and Zev. Zev was Gershon's very dear friend. Gershon has passed away since, and I'm sure Zev probably has as well by yes. now. But uh, we went to the first harvest down in the valley, uh, going towards Tel Aviv. But uh, before you get to Tel Aviv. We actually took and harvested the first harvest of the sheaf harvest yes. of, of, you know, and the he barley took me. harvest. He took me. Yes. The, um, the Israeli police had to give us an escort. And I remember hearing them, you know, because I can, I can understand Hebrew. And I'm listening to them on the radio saying, you know, it's Gershon Solomon. And he's wanting to take and go to the Temple Mount and, and to do the, do the offering. Well, they would not allow us in the Temple Mount. But we went to the gates of the Temple Mount. And you led that procession with Gershon. Yes. Uh, carrying the, the barley harvest in that beautiful basket there. Exactly. Up to there for 
making the way, it's called the wave offering biblically, mm -hmm. that was to be made at well, that Well, he took first me to harvest. the field of barley, yes. and I was picking it with him and his associates, and we were putting it in a basket and had me carry the basket. Somebody's that picture of me. Yeah, I'll and, share um, that with people here. Yes, so uh, I, that's why I say that what we did was out of our full heart of belief, uh, through the Schofield lens, as we were taught on a Christian side, right? Uh, so it's hard to really uh, judge people when they do it from heart, but yet you know that they are in blindness, that they are doing something wrong, right? And that it, it took us a journey, journey to get to what we are now. Uh, but at the same time, we are in Israel and a lot of pastors are coming in and we became really good friends. If you remember Pastor Paul Begley. Yes. And times we had are absolutely amazing. As, yes. as we spoke of, about Christ, and I know that even Pastor Paul Begley uh, and his wife, uh, very hospitable. We had amazing times. We had love for Jewish people. We both discussed Bible through Schofield lens. We were on that same tune and the friendships we made were amazing so when we when steve and i started to see things and as we saw more and more and more and started to look into christ and new testament and how it goes with the old and with the talmud and all these jews and israel as a political nation things started to unravel and we came to a point where we just could not in a good heart and conscience continue Yes, and let me let me just say, I'm, uh, pardon me, I'm actually, I get inspired, and when I get inspired, I have to make notes so I don't forget. Yes, sorry. Right? <laughs> what was it, though? We had come to the place where you remember the parable that Jesus gave? If the blind lead the blind, mm -hmm. they will both fall in the ditch. In the book of Revelation, the Laodiceans were said to be blind, naked, and they don't even know it. Jesus says, I counsel you to buy of me eye salve that you might have eyes and can see. What is the blind leading the blind? It's when Christians that have become blind, like it's written in Laodicea, about this last age people, which that's actually down through the ages, but we'll use it for this purpose, last age, they've become blind. And now they have allowed the Pharisees to lead them. Christianity has allowed the Jewish rabbis to lead you. The very ones that he said that were blind, you've allowed them to lead you. And now you both will fall in the ditch unless you do what he says. I counsel you to buy of me eyes, have, that you might have eyes and can see. So, so just to continue... Um, when we came to understanding that the lens of Schofield is wrong and it takes us away from Christ, from the rock that is Christ, to put on that same place the Jewish people, the rabbis as teachers, this is when everything fell apart and our friendships fell apart. Because when we told our friends, our pastor friends, we can no longer support this ideology and we have to come to Christ for real um, we kind of lost all the friendship we, we lost a lot of listeners we went totally down and we because we spoke the truth and our regrets with Steve is that when when we were, had this privilege to be in Israel that we did not go and visit Palestinian Christians yes. and their plight. That we didn't go and we did, but for a brief period of time in Bethlehem. Very, very little. Uh, very but little. we were focusing on rabbis and the Jewish, you know, the, the Jewish the fear rabbis. And, mongering of yes. the Jews had been so injected yes. into us. Yes. It's almost like this picture that you have here it kind of made me think when they're wearing their mask. I think of it as silence, mm -hmm. you know. I remember, Steve, Americans and Christians, you keep were, your mouth shut. Yes, when, we, when I was in a hotel, we were supposed to fly out of uh, uh, Tel Aviv the next day, and you had to go through West Bank still. Uh, you put me in a hotel and the kids, and you and my dad uh, went uh, to a West Bank, because I don't know if you forgot something or what. Something was there that 
revisited and we forgot and you had to go get it. And I remember not being able to sleep because you had to come through West Bank and I was so brainwashed that they can, the Arabs can kill you. Yeah. That they, or they can target you, they can kill you, they're terrorists and it's, it's just the fear was awful, right? So I was praying and then you come and I asked, was there anything? He said, no, it was perfectly peaceful. We just drove with no problems, <laughs> right? And I had done that so many times, you know. And, and I'll never right. forget the one pastor friend of mine that I knew from West Palm Beach. <clears throat> and he may have already passed away by now. He was elderly. He was so chatty, so fun. He looked like uh, Michael Jordan. So every everybody would call him Michael when we would travel, especially the Palestinians. And he loved the Palestinians. I like that about him, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we're driving through the West Bank, right? And I haven't told him yet, right? He, we passed Jericho, and you could hear the shooting and the bombs going off in the background. And it's right at the end of the second intifada. And it goes, hey, Brother Steve, Brother Steve, he says, uh, where are we at, brother? I've been all chatty the whole time. I said, we're in the West Bank. And then the next thing I know, for about the next half hour, he hadn't said a word. And I finally, I said, Brother Daryl, I said, are you okay? And he goes, Brother Steve, quiet, brother. I'm praying. Good God, brother, you brought me to the West Bank, brother. Hallelujah, brother. we got to make it out of here alive. I know. Right? But that was the fear that was the instilled brain, in Christians. But yeah, yet, that. he had no idea all the Palestinians that he met and was so friendly to him and he was so friendly to them. Mm -hmm. And the love they were showing him you know, because he was a Christian. Yes. So. And, you know, when we had these minimal experiences with Palestinians, they were always so hospitable. Yes. Uh, they always made us tea and they gave us food and they were hospitable. And I, yeah, I remember in my heart and mind, I was saying, why are they saying they're terrorists? I mean, they seem to be just hospitable people. Uh, like, I didn't understand. I just know that I was brainwashed, very badly brainwashed. And we looked upon IDF as the most moral army in the world that is protecting the Jewish people from the worst enemies. And um, I remember that a lot of people back then, the Zionist uh, Christians, supported our ministry and they were sending us money to give money to IDF. And I remember how I was doing everything they said to have clear conscience. To, to, to the Orthodox um, community. Yes, I was supposed to, I had specific person send me money and uh, that man said, I want you to give $100 to IDF uh, and, and specific places yeah. and I would do any, that. Any Orthodox people that right. we saw that were in need help them right. and we did we and went you, you have pictures we, yes video yes. everything mm -hmm. oh I, you know and he told me he said brother steve you don't have to do that because i was telling him i said you know we video this as we go and he says you don't have to do that yeah he because said, we wanted you. to make sure we do everything that yeah. you wanted us to do that people right. wanted us to do so i remember going up to idf they were uh right there with a stand some you know and with the guns and i went up to them and bring the money and they're mm -hmm. looking at me like i'm crazy and I said, well, look, we are Christians, and uh, this is just something that Christians want to give you to thank you for uh, protecting yes. the Jewish people. We so, always said that, too. Mm -hmm. that this is, whether we did it from our own heart or whether we were doing it for others that asked us, we always let them know there are Christian people that love you and mm -hmm. want to help you. Yes. And I remember that I gave them that money. <laughs> they burst out in laugh when I left. And, you know, I kind of felt weird, but I was just trying to do what people asked me to do. But anyway, now looking back at it and all this knowledge we came to, and especially when we did look into Talmud and Zohar and Kabbalah, and we started to see that how they hate Jesus and hate Christians and yes. that all of this is fake. All these bridges that we're making with uh, the Jewish people, because Steve even went to Knesset with Barry Paul Bagley. You talked to Yehuda Glick. I met Yehuda Glick. I was Glick. actually... He, Yehuda Glick loved my son, Ethan. Oh, yes, he did. Ethan. He exchanged and, and emails with Ethan personal and stuff emails. so that they could write each other. Yes, and, and, and so he's a nice man, like nice man, yeah. but sincerely brainwashed. Yeah. And yeah, um, Yehuda was, he's a very kind man. Very, very kind, kind man when he talks to you, but he's brainwashed with his ideology. And this is where we come to, that religion can brainwash you. Certain lenses that you read the scriptures with can brainwash you to such a point 
that you are doing wrong in the name of God. Mm-hmm. And that's the point of this particular broadcast today. Yes, so. yes. So it showed that our love, and, and let me explain another thing too. We've never lost our love for the Jewish people because there are a lot of good Jewish people that want only to be free to serve God the way they believe. And they, they don't, they're not there to harm Palestinians. Now, sadly enough, there is a large part of the population that's brainwashed into that ideology, you know. But we still care about them, but we care about the Palestinian people as well. We care about, you know, and we don't differentiate any longer, you know. I mean, granted, there are what we what some would ter- uh, deem as terrorists, you know, but quite frankly, the only ones that I find that are terrorists are the ones that the that Netanyahu is funded. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and you that know, is religious. Hamas is funded by Netanyahu. He said it publicly. Ron Paul has dis- uh, disclosed it to American people. Yes, if they listen to Ron Paul when he was yes yeah. when he was in the the Senate. He clearly showed that that he he said we're funding them. Yes. And he said it's going to come back to haunt us one so day. So it is a theater. In 2018, they, Netanyahu says it before the Knesset. Yeah. Okay? They cause divisions because they are creating theater for the masses and dividing you mm-hmm. against each other. Okay? And as as Christians, the question is where we stand. And we are to stand on a rock that's Christ, and that's it. We see all people as equal. And we know that only Christ as Iraq is the solution to all of this to bring peace. So what I wanted to say uh, before we go into this article, evangelical support for Israel is fueled by apocalyptic hopes. Okay, there is a certain um, explanation of apocalypse coming and they incorporated Israel and uh, political Israel and Middle East happenings into that apocalyptic um, doctrine. Yes. And that's how they explain the... And doctrine to you and what they do with this is they cause you to commit sins in the name of God because to promote death of children innocent women and children I don't care if they're Muslim I don't care what religion they are that's a sin right so you partaking or people who are promoting this are partaking in a sin that Jesus would never partake in and that's because you have Bible wrongly explained. Now, um, if Steve and I, if our ministry has helped you personally to come out of Zionism, you were with us in Zionism, Zionist Christianity, and we helped you to come out, please email us, israelinewslive at protonmail.com because we would like to invite you and tell your story. How did you come out? And how our ministry helped you to come out of Zionist Christianity to Christ, to the light of Jesus. Okay, so uh, over here, I found this, uh, because we had this talk today about regrets in the past. That, yes. Um, uh, we have another video coming out today, still yet. Too, yes, so. we have evangelical support for Israel is fueled by apocalyptic hopes by Michael Rowley. And he's writing his own uh, experience how he grew up in a community of Schofield Christian Zionist oriented Christians and how he had this awakening and his uh, kind of uh, summary of this is ultimately I came to the realization that if supporting the occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians was what was required for me to stand in support of Israel I no longer could so he came to the same realization. Your heart starts speaking to you. Your conscience starts speaking to you. And you no longer can support it. And you don't care what you lose. Friends, popularity. Because you speak now for lives. And that's what matters. So uh, I will. We, we can post this article. But here he says, for us and many evangelical Christians across the country, It was our duty to defend and support Israel. Israel was God's chosen nation, and the formation of the country in 1948 was understood to be fulfillment of end-time prophecy, specifically the second coming of Christ. The message we heard in church was 
that end time prophecy was unfolding in front of our eyes and God needed our help to speed up the process toward an apocalyptic Armageddon that would yeah. ultimately culminate in the return of Christ. So who doesn't want Jesus here right now? So if that's what we have to do, Super Israel, oh, let's do it, right? Mm -hmm. So those that opposed Israel would stand with the Antichrist, and their blood would flow in a valley of Megiddo all the way up to the horse's bits. That's how they interpret Revelation 14, 20. This is not a fringe metaphorical fantasy, but a widespread evangelical belief. Let me make this larger so people can see this. Tied to real political happenings here in U.S. and in Israel, Palestine. Okay, hold on, because okay. that's, I want to read some You're of still it. In this, so right important. There's where you finished. Mm -hmm. okay. It wasn't until my teenage years and then into my early 20s that cracks in my identity, religious beliefs, and worldview began to form and widen. I started hearing stories, seeing films, and reading more about Palestinians living and suffering under Israeli occupation. I made my first trip to the region and was shocked and dismayed by what I witnessed. I was too, but still brainwashed. I couldn't rationalize the church's adamant political, monetary, and emotional support for the state of Israel with the Jesus in the Bible who said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But mm. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. That's in Matthew 5, 43 and 45. Ultimately, I came to realization that if supporting the occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians was what was required for me to stand in support of Israel, I no longer could. Fast forward to today, that gentleman made a film, his second film has released Praying for Armageddon, and it focuses on the end time theology that I grew up hearing and its role in politics and foreign policy today. The film held its U.S. premiere in October 8, the day after Hamas attack. Co-director Tony Henson Shea and I have devoted years to investigating and revealing the powerful U.S. evangelical infiltration into politics and foreign police of the U.S. in Israel-Palestine. So that's, you know, important film to watch. Now playing out in real time, we have seen evangelical political, sorry, I have the little... Little fly, keep <laughs> occasionally, yes. Yes, we have seen evangelical, political, and religious leaders all around the world rallying to support Israeli military counterattacks, even if that means supporting war crimes. And that's what's important here, Steve. They support war crimes, that Jesus would never be part of this. Yeah, because Jesus said, love your enemies, and they're doing the exact, and we had, were doing the exact opposite. Instead of loving the enemy, we've embraced mm -hmm. I, I will I will I will read this because it's important Senator it's a Senator Lindsey Graham proudly boasted on Fox News we are in a religious war here I am with Israel do whatever the hell you have to do to defend yourself level the place okay on October 9 Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant used genocidal language and endorsed collective punishment on Palestine, Palestinian civil, civilians, which is a war crime. If you go on X on Twitter and you watch what's happening to those children, and if you don't cry at night, there is something wrong with you. Okay. So again, he used genocidal language when he said that there would be a complete siege on Gaza. There will be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything will be closed. We are fighting against human animals and we are uh, acting accordingly. Through our investigations in praying for Armageddon, it became shockingly clear that there are many powerful political, religious, military leaders ready to pull the trigger on a holy war that could be devastating to our global civilization. 
we must ask these leaders whether they see themselves as instrumental in an apocalyptic prophetic vision and then ask ourselves whether we are willing to let them retain their power. Now he gives seven practical steps to end violence in Israel and Palestine. And I will leave you with the link because we will be here three hours with everything we have prepared for you today. But read what he has to say. Watch that movie and understand that we are having a wrong lens that we are interpreting Bible here in the United States with. And there is a very small percentage of true Christians, true Christian pastors, just like Chuck Baldwin, for example, is. Okay, Chuck Baldwin from um, yes, it, uh, Montana. Yeah, Montana. So uh, I, I encourage you personally, from my personal experience, to look into this and come out of these sins of supporting war crimes, death, violence, and bloodshed the way it's been happening. You are having false promises. Uh, they're waiting on their Messiah, okay? So let me give you what, what you got, uh, you're going to hear now. This is what you're hearing from the uh, people who are supporting genocide. So watch this happen. Oops, Stevie, I need you. Okay. Um, you want to play it? It doesn't, yeah, just a little bit. Okay, let me first bring it large. Opening. Yeah, no, In no, no sound, okay. that's Amen. what I mean. It's all right. That's, you get all the sound settings done, but then there always end up being one little sound problem, and we just, we don't want that. We want the actual... to make sure that our output there we got some okay should fix it so watch this happening in front of your eyes you're going to see it in the news evil can no longer hide and good can no longer be concealed that's Mashiach and it is happening. It's happening. Pay attention. Okay. Go. So let's just say that. Didn't Jesus say, wow, to those who call evil good? And, yes. and good. Evil. Evil. Okay. Because when you go to their side, okay, he's, he's a rabbi. And he says that, oh, you're going to see the evil no longer be here. Who is he talking about? What is he talking about? And he says that he's... That it's the Moshiach coming. What Moshiach? Right? Who is yeah. this Messiah that's so coming? So when you're right supporting now? the blind, right. you're going to be led into that false Messiah. And a lot of people, it was, mm -hmm. here's what's weird. A lot of Christians know this. Yes. They know they that supporting support that, right? Mm -hmm. That it's, oh, it's going to bring the Antichrist. We know the building of the third temple is going to be the, bring the Antichrist, but they all want to help build it, right? Look, there was one time you were supposed to stand behind Israel for the building of the temple. It was 2,500 years ago when they were returning back to the promised land then and building the temple. Not that he needed a temple made with hands, as he clearly said. The Most High dwells not in the temple made with hands, but because the Messiah was coming. It was only a signing of the coming of the, of the yes, Messiah. Yes, because he was sending his Holy Spirit, and you are that temple. Yes, exactly. We are, our bodies are the temple, and he lives within us. And that's, why that's the only yeah. temple we support. Right, that's right? why he said the temple would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That's right. The world is moving in a very good direction. Mm. It always has been. Since creation, it's been moving in a good direction. But it was so concealed, so mysterious. Now, what he's saying it was concealed is that the Jews, the rabbis, have the the, the secrets, and now they're going to be unconcealed because they're going to be leading the world, right? So this is what he—that's his yeah. message. That's why it's three minutes. Oh, look! Everything that's happening is good. It's good because Moshiach is coming. So everything is happening because they are artificially fulfilling prophecies through wrong lenses. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I want to, we will leave you with those links so you can see. Now, I have talked about Pola Light before on, on my Odyssey channel. I do have I and Eliana Odyssey channel. But this is the example. This is from the year of uh, 2023. 
Yeah, June Hold 15, our right. He says, Trump's faith advisor says Christians must learn from the Jews, not convert them. So basically what she says is that there is a two ways to salvation. One, because you're Jewish through genealogy and you're chosen and you are priestly class as a Jew. That's what she says to you. Okay. And then uh, the other one is through Christ and... Uh, you as Christians don't even talk about Jesus to Jews, but you have to do is learn from them. Well, who is she learning from? The rabbis that believe in Talmud, Zohar, and Kabbalah. Through they, they interpret Old Testament scripture through Talmud, Zohar, and Kabbalah. Wrong lenses, okay? And she's telling you to go and learn from them. And um, I think... Here we go. And, and that comes back to what I said at the beginning. Yes. If the blind lead the blind, you're both going to fall in the ditch. Because for you to go and learn from them, you are clearly following that scripture. By the way, that other scripture there in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 2, where it talks about that the word of God will go out from Jerusalem. I just found recently where Jesus actually says that scripture was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So look at this. There are so many churches in America, she says, that are deeply hungry to understand Torah, White said. You can be Jewish without being Christian, but you cannot be Christian without understanding Judaism. That's what she said. You cannot be Christian until you understand Judaism. What is Judaism? What is Judaism's sacred scripture, Steve? The, the Talmud. The Talmud. That's their sacred scripture. Yeah. And we have talked about, I know we had a tragedy happen and I was kind of shut down, but I was at my peak uh, before the tragedy. At our peak, we were at ministry, bringing a lot of pre people from Zionist lenses back to Jesus. And um, tragedy hit. So I, I had a two and a half years, very difficult time. So um, I'm praying that I can stay strong and we can come back and yes. help as many people as we can. But uh, here we go. She added that it is an injustice to ourselves not to understand the habits and laws of God as told in a Jewish Bible. What Jewish Bible is she referring to? Well, the Jewish Bible is Talmud Taint Bible because you, she's sending you to Pharisees to learn from them. And she goes and she learns from them. And she has her personal and, uh, and what rabbi, did Jesus say? Rab Je rabbi, woman. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus even says... There are two. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all the laws hang on those two. Mm -hmm. Paula White on the left is with Rebbe Tzin, Shani Taragin. Okay, I talked about this on Odyssey, so go and check out that video because I, I did it in depth. Uh, but she is learning the Torah or Old Testament through lenses of the Talmud. Now, I wanted to bring to people some of the weird stuff Talmud teaches, and we can't go into every aspect. There are more important ones that we want to talk about and bring, and we should, Steve, do like very systemic teaching on everything so you can understand how Judaism and the real Christianity that Jesus uh, brought to us, that they don't go together. They're diametrically opposed like if you were putting two magnets together and they can't stick together. They're trying to come back, but they can't because they're opposing each other. And that's exactly what's happening. Like Messiah in Judaism is a human political figure. Messiah in Christianity is God in flesh, Christ. <laughs> right? So that's like... Because Judaism teaches that um, God cannot become a man. Mm-hmm. God cannot become a man and be the Messiah, right? Uh, so uh, they're, they're basically teaching that Jesus was just a human. They speak about him very badly in, in Talmud, if you know the Talmud. Very they're trying. Him. They're trying to polish it up for Christianity, though, to make you think, oh, he is really a good guy. He's actually Jewish. He's one of us. Right. They're, they're trying to infect Christianity with uh, language like Jesus was a Pharisee. He, Jesus was Jewish. That's why we have to listen to the Jews. This is all false reasoning. And um, so 
So two, two differences are in between Judaism and Christianity, two main ones. Who is the Messiah and who is their Messiah? Always political figure. Uh, they have a Josephic Messiah and Davidic Messiah, but both have to be politicians who will bring peace, uh, global peace. And we know that Bible teaches, they say peace, peace, but there is no peace. There is no peace. Uh, okay, but I wanted to bring some very awkward teachings of the Talmud. So you know what the rabbis are preoccupied with. Um, now, hold on, Steve, Can because this is this hard. Up. I don't know if this is in this one, might be in different. Hold on. No, it's, uh, it will be a... Click that off. Okay. Um, for example, so you know... Babylonian Talmud Tractat Yebamoth Folio 63a. What these teachers believe that Paula I'm White says to go up. to them, okay? Uh, the weirdest stuff, sinful stuff, like here, Eleazar further stated what is meant by the scriptural text. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So here we go, example. Right. We, From have Genesis. A, on, we have a Genesis scripture as Christians. We have our own Christian scholars. When a Christian scholar sees the scripture, this is the now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. How would you interpret that scripture in Christianity? That they're one. That they're one. That husband and wife are basically yeah. one that flesh she was, together, Basically right? what Adam is saying there is that she was made from me. Right, exactly. Uh, so it's something beautiful. But look what rabbis from the Talmud I'm going to make teach. it bigger because they really need to see yes. this. Because I don't want somebody to say, oh my gosh, I couldn't see it. Here we okay. go. Here you go. Now you can see it. This teaches, that's their interpretation. This is R stands for rabbi. So Rabbi Eliezer, who's very, very well known in the commentaries in the Talmud. Yes. So okay. this teaches, supposedly that scripture teaches us that Adam had intercourse with every beast. An animal, but found no satisfaction until he cohabited with Eve. So, Paula White tells you, you have to go learn Judaism. And there's thousands of beliefs that are bizarre, okay? So that you, you need to know about that. It's just that it's hard to even talk about some of them. But Paula White tells you, go to the, we need to learn from these people something, that they're our teachers, they're interpreters of the Old Testament, and they know, because we don't. And they teach that that scripture is interpreted that Adam committed bestiality in a Garden of Eden, and he had sex with every beast and every animal, and he wasn't satisfied, so God brought him Eve. And those are supposedly our teachers. Those mm. are the ones who will be interpreting Noahide laws. Those are the ones who are around our politicians in White House and our governors when they are doing uh, laws for the public schools. Like, you know, so... The, even this next one, I want to bring this out for the simple fact is, is that when Israel talks about slavery, that every Gentile is going to be their slave, indirectly, it's exactly what he's saying here. Eliezer again says... What is meant by the text, and in thee shall the families of the earth be blessed. Now, we know it's actually speaking about Jesus Christ. It's only because of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ that the families of the earth are blessed. And that's all families, right? But he says here, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Abraham, I have two goodly shoots to engraft on you, Ruth the Moabitess and Nam the Ammonitess. All the families of the earth, even the other families who live in the earth, are blessed only for Israel's sake. Yes. All the nations of the earth, even the ships that go forth from Gaul to Spain, are blessed only for Israel's sake. Totally negating the seed, which was Jesus Christ, that that's what would be blessed. All the families of the earth be blessed because of his coming. Now it's turned the other way around. They're going to create all these different blood, these two different bloodlines, and they're all to serve Israel. Yes. So basically, uh, just like um, they have a teaching that God made Gentiles look human only for one reason. So when they serve the Jew, the Jew doesn't have to look at an animal. And that's their real teaching. So 
this is where Paula White is sending you. This, this is I'm I'm showing you Judaism right here. That's their sacred scripture. Do you think that Adam had sex with dogs, monkeys, whales, um, that's what, that's tigers, what he's teaching. lions, cats? You name it. Adam had sex with every animal. The giraffe. The giraffes. The and then he wasn't satisfied, so God brought Eve. Yeah, it's unbelievable what you find in this Talmud. And they are telling you that these are the chosen people of the almighty God, whose son is Jesus Christ. It's insane, people. Please, please get these people out of the Zionistic Christianity. Oh, okay. Uh, another bizarre teaching was... They're, they have all kinds of weird teachings how to behave in a bathroom, for example. They will spend days in the yeshivas uh, studying and studying and studying how to behave in a bathroom because they are superstitious. They, it's just weird to even spend your day on this, how you go relieve yourself, okay? So this is what these people are occupied with. But the brains are occupied with this, and those people are called scholars, and you're supposed to learn from them, according to Paula White. So, like, for example, let's read. This is another Talmud. You want to read it? <clears throat> it was taught in uh, Barita in Tractate Terka Eretz that Rabbi Akiva said, I once entered the bathroom after my teacher, Rabbi Yehoshua. Think about that one, right? And I learned yeah. three things from observing his behavior. I learned that one should not defecate while facing east and west, but rather while facing north and south. I learned that one should not uncover himself while standing, but while sitting, in the interest of modesty. And I learned that one should not wipe with his right hand, but with his left hand. Ben Aziza, a student of Rabbi Akiva, said to him, You were impertinent to your teacher to that extent that you observed that much, he replied, It is Torah, and I must learn. Right, so what is the Torah? What if you don't have a left hand? No, the thing is, <laughs> right, but the problem is, this is Torah. So when you say, go learn Torah from the Jews, I mean, this is what they're learning. How to wipe your... How to wipe your butt. But with Never use hand? your right hand and, and, only your left. And, and that's their sacred. But what if they're left-handed and not uh, right-handed? You know, I mean, think about it. And it keeps going and going, and it goes into even weirder things that you wouldn't, that your mind would stop and say, wait a minute, what is this? It's like mocking of God. This is mocking. You know, like it continues. I learned that one should not defecate while facing east and west, but rather while facing north and south. I learned that one should not uncover himself. It's the same thing. This is Torah mm -hmm. I must learn. Um, and, and he goes about everything. So they have these superstition and horrific laws well, that they go by and burdens they put on people. It reminds you of see, Jesus. Here's the thing. Saying, What's funny, Nehemiah Gordon, he is a Karite Jew. And he will bring out all the crazy things, but he doesn't bring out these type, but he does bring out like the other crazy things about why you have to wash your hands a certain way, why you have to just, you tie your left shoe before your right shoe, etc. I really wish Nehemiah Gordon would have the courage to come out and show these crazy things too. You know, they have here, this is uh, in a Talmud, okay, um, we are giving you here directly from their Talmud, it's called uh, Halakha.com, which Halakha means Jewish law. Mm -hmm. So, question, why should one wipe with the left hand and not with the right? Rabbi said, because the Torah was given with the right hand, as it says, and his right hand was a fire of the law unto them. So, again, I want you to know this. They will take Bible verse from Old Testament, from Scripture. And his hand, right hand was a fiery law unto them. They will take that text and then they start perverting it completely perverting it into nonsensical, most debilitating things that your brain is overwhelmed and you stop and you say, what? And these people are supposed to be my teachers and interpreters? Okay, so how do they interpret that scripture? Rabbi Hannah said, because it is brought to the mouth, because you eat with the right hand. 
um, Simeon and Lakish said because one binds the tefillin on the left arm with it. Nachman Isaac said because he points to the accents in a scroll with it. You know, because how you use your right hand. A let, similar let me, difference of opinion okay. is found among Tananim Eliezer. He says because one eats with it, because you eat with the right hand. What if you're left-handed? Anyway, Joshua says because one writes with it. Akiba says because one points with it to the accent of the scroll and blah, blah, blah. So this let, is why you're supposed to wipe yourself with the left hand. Now, let me explain something that's very important. If you get this many different rabbis commenting in the Talmud about one rab one got one student that paid attention to the way the guy went and went to the bathroom to defecate and all the procedures that he went through, and then so many rabbis are now also commenting on it, you have to understand the Talmud is ever ongoing. This is why we have uh, the other books that were written uh, very very strongly by Menachem Schneerson the group of writings that they have with him that they use there, all the way down to the Noahide laws, and they say there are seven. Now you see how it goes. This is why we know there's not just seven. There's, according to oh, Rabbi Tovia no Singer, there's, there's more than a hundred. Yes, and according to another rabbi, they just came out, and I want to play that for people next time. Now they have a new Noahide laws, and they're 30. Yeah. That's the newest. Yeah. So, yeah. and the thing is, is any of these rabbis, even to this day here, could add more and more and more laws. And they're definitely going to have anti-Semitic laws put in there. You can count on that. They'll use that as saying that oh, you were anti-Semitic. So that means you spoke against, you know, uh, the Holy One and his children or who knows what they're going to come up with. Yeah. So as an American, I believe that they have right to their beliefs. If that's what they want to study all day, how to wipe yourself with what hand, whatever. Uh, and there is other bizarre teachings. Go ahead and do this all day. I don't care. But stay in your synagogues, within your community, and then do that what you want. But just don't push it on me. Don't start telling me that, and, and that these Christians, are God's, God's chosen. And, and I go to Christian church and Paula White will say, we need to understand, we can't be Christians unless we understand Judaism. And look, Paula White has that right to say it. The thing that we're trying to show you is what Jesus taught us. If the blind lead the blind, they're both going to yes. fall in the ditch. So if you go underneath these t teachings, you're not going to make it. No. Okay, it's, you're not. Let's just face it. As far as eternal salvation of your soul. And anyway, I will bring one more, one more uh, weird Talmud teaching. You know how people are going back to law and they do all these festivals and feasts and... Right. You know, this is very popular, and we used to do Sabbath, and we used to even do feasts, Steve, but they have this Shavuot 9AB, uh, Atonement and the New Moon, and that's, that's one of their uh, feasts. But uh, what Christians don't know, maybe Christians have it interpreted a different way, that it's for the sins, the goat takes the sins away, right? But what Judaism teaches... And Paula, I told you you can't be Christian unless you know it, so you need to know it. What Judaism teaches, that particular holiday or that particular atonement is for the sins of God. The rabbis are saying that God, Almighty God, who created this universe, is a sinner because he created moon smaller than the sun. Mm -hmm. And God gave them this uh, new moon, you know, the, the holiday, mm -hmm. to atone for his sin of creating moon smaller than the sun. So that's Judaism for you. How weird and awkward is that? Okay. It says here, the Gemara quotes another teaching derived from this passage. Uh, Reish Kish says that the sacrifice brought on Rosh, Hodesh makes <clears throat> reference to a sin offering la Hashem. Okay? Sin offering for Hashem, for God. God sent their offering goat for him. Because God says that to the Jewish people that this sacrifice should be brought to atone for God having minimized the moon. Okay? And that's their official Judaic teaching. And here, here it is explained in Rav Kuk Torah. 
which we are going to speak yeah. about Rav Kook because he's got some really weird opinions in his books um, about Gentiles yeah. being animals. In fact, it is him that said that God created uh, Gentiles in a form of a human flesh for one reason, so the Jew doesn't have to look at an animal when Gentile slaves him. So these are the Judaic teachings. And so when any pastor is bringing you and telling you that you are to go learn from the rabbis, run away, turn the other way. Our teacher is Holy Spirit. We have Christ, the rock, and his teachings are beautiful. Good for every human being on earth, regardless tribe, nation, uh, race. Doesn't matter who you are, because he says, everyone come to the waters of life for free. Mm -hmm. There is no more beautiful teachings than we already have in Christ. We don't need to learn from the rabbis. So uh, let me let me throw in one thought too, because you've mentioned now here near the end of the broadcast and at the beginning, you mentioned about Christ being our rock. And we've talked so much about where we, the blind lead the blind, etc., right? In Isaiah 17, before the destruction of Damascus, one of the things that God said to Isaiah is that you were not mindful of your rock. This is why Damascus will be destroyed. You see, Paul wanted to destroy it 2,000 years ago, but he couldn't. Christ stopped him. He knew that it was going to happen in a future time. And this time it's going to be because the Christians have forgotten their rock, which is Christ Jesus. So when you begin to forget your rock and where your foundation should be, you're willing to murder and kill and will become complicit in the blood of innocent people. Yes. And in the beginning, we have asked you if our ministry helped you to come out of Zionist Christianity, Schofield Christianity, uh, please write us, Israeli News Live at protonmail.com. And we would like to hear from you, your testimony. And here I will tell you that don't lose hope that somebody is not going to see uh the light, and I'm not talking necessarily the light of Christ right now, because I don't think that the gentleman I'm about to show you is, is, is a Christian. He is a Jew, he's a Jewish person, and I respect him very much. Uh, but this is a former APAC member, if you know what APAC is. Oh, yes. Okay. So he has uh, given his testimony how strongly he was pro-Israel. And then he read the books by Professor Finkelstein, Okay, about Palestinian plight, Nakba, and all these things that he didn't even know existed. Because Jewish people are actually brainwashed by their rabbis and government. They're brainwashed. They're giving them wrong history and everything. And when they learn, a lot of them can't continue in supporting their own country. Right? Yes. And, and this is putting Christianity aside. This is just common human being sense. So listen to him, what he has to say. I will, we will leave you with the um, link, and he has a full testimony somewhere, but um, his name is Rich Forer, a former APAC member. And find some of these books. My stipulation was I only wrote down the names of books and the names of authors who were Jewish. I wasn't going to trust that a non-Jewish author could be honest or not anti-Semitic. This is how um, uh, radical I was. So I went to the library, got a few books, came home, the next day I started reading, and maybe about a week after reading fairly uninteresting material that didn't really uh, address my concerns that much, I started reading Norman Finkelstein's Beyond Chutzpah on the misuse of anti-Semitism and the abuse of history. I had never heard of Finkelstein. My friend who had, who had directed me to Kimmerling and Reinhardt had years earlier had said that Joan Peters' book was debunked by a Jewish professor who lived in New York, but he couldn't remember the name. And he was referring to Finkelstein. And I just said, oh, well, that, I don't believe that. The Jewish professor must have been confused, or maybe he's a self-hating Jew. So I started reading <laughs> Finkelstein's book, and what happened was, everything, I knew immediately that he was a brilliant, that he was a brilliant man. And his, everything he said 
His criticism was only directed towards Israel. There was no criticism of the Palestinian people at all, or the Arab or the Arab uh, side. And I was wondering, well, when's he going to speak out about the Arabs? But I couldn't put the book down because number one, I had committed myself to really studying the history as objectively as I could, and number two, I recognized in the first paragraph of the book that he was a brilliant man. Somehow I recognized that, so I kept reading. Plus. He documented all of his claims very meticulously. So his sources were organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, B'Tselem, the Israeli Human Rights Organization. And so I was reading and reading and reading. And as I was reading, I would go look online for the doc, for the uh, sources that he was citing in his book. So I go to the to the uh, papers that Amnesty International for example, that they had written on the subject. And I would look for the quotes he had taken from them. I was hoping that I would find him taking the quotes out of context or changing a word here or there to misrepresent what the organization was saying. Unfortunately, sort of, at least from that prior point of view, he was everything he said was impeccable. There was nothing that, uh, he, everything, he was beyond reproach. So I continued reading, and at a certain point, I started. Be I, I was so absorbed in what I was reading that I allowed all the emotions that were going through me. I didn't resist at all. So I was going through shock at what I was reading. Oh my God! I've supported Israel all these years. This is what Israel's doing. Oh my God! And then anger at Israel for misguiding me all my life and getting me to support. The, the maltreatment of Palestinians. Then my anger turned in on itself and I got angry at me for being such a dupe and being so ignorant and never checking anything out. And then shame and embarrassment arose. And then finally a great sorrow for the Palestinian people for all that they had been through. So like yeah. the fact that you read the book, though I'm dubious you read the last two chapters because they're so tough. I had to reread the book, you know, after October 7, because I had forgotten a lot. The book came out in 2018, and I needed to, as it were, arm myself for the battles ahead. And I was amazed at the level of detail and the complexity of the argument. I, I think it's a great book. I don't care what anyone says. The mental investment, you know, most authors, Professor Chomsky said, most historians are good clerks. They go through archives and then what do they do? They arrange the material mm -hmm. logically, what's called nowadays a narrative. There is no such thing as that in this book. Every paragraph has an argument, mm -hmm. you know, worked out trying to make sense of what's going on here. It was very, it wasn't a labor of love, it was a labor of anger. You, you write this in your uh, preface or introduction, yeah. Uh, it wasn't a labor of love to complete this book. So angry at the lies, yeah. you know. Right now I'm writing something on Joan Donahue, the ICJ president who sleep mm -hmm. opaque. Move on for the sake Do you know every report I read? Yeah. 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 Let me see. Yeah, but, but what, what I wanted to show you is this, this gentleman. Uh, look for Rich Forer, former APAC member, who gives his testimony how he came out from supporting Israel to truth of what the true history of Israel 1948 was, what really truly happened, because they are brainwashing Jewish people. They're actually, Jewish people are victims here. And if you truly love them, tell them the truth so they can come out of the lies and brainwashing yes. to light, of course, to truth. Okay, so people are waking up, but it takes each one of us to reach out to your family members. And you might be hated for a little bit, but try with love. I don't know. Uh, so that's what we're going to do with Steve. We have big plans. I hope they will happen. It's very difficult, so we do need help. Um, spread yes. this video, uh, talk to people. Yes, and your financial support as well is so so valuable. And there's multiple ways to do that. IsraeliNewsLive.org, you can donate right there online. Our address is there. And Patreon.com forward slash IsraeliNewsLive, another way to support the broadcast. We are planning so. on doing um, conferences again. 
uh, where we will be presenting true history of how 1948 happened, the true sources for Schofield misrepresentation. How did that come to Christianity? I mean, Steve, this is such a new movement, Schofield movement. Yeah. You know, we are looking at things from perspective of our lifetime. We are here, what, like 70 years, 60 years, 50 years, 40 years. You might be 30 years old, 40 years old, 70 years mm -hmm. old, whatever. But that's not how history happens, okay? Look at the thousands of years of history. Well, Schofield rep, uh, interpretation is this tiny in a timeline of history, this tiny. Yeah. It's brand new. It's cult. It's a cult. I actually and go into a, that in the book I'm writing It actually now. entered Christianity and completely filthed it up. So that way, Christians support war, bloodshed, lies, wrong things, and they are putting on a seed of Christ uh, certain genealogy of people. And they forget about the rock that is Christ, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So anyway, I, I, that's all for today for me. Okay, and well, we will, we will wrap it down then. So definitely, you definitely want to take a look at this here. And uh, we appreciate your kindness, your love, your support for this work that we're doing. We have yet another video coming out today. It is going very deep. Uh, I'm not going to speak about it on this broadcast because I don't want to mix the two. Uh, but Live, right? You want to go live? Oh, I don't know. Maybe not. We'll see. We're, don't, okay. we're doing an experiment today anyway because we want to see how the views work as far as is it better to be live or not live. And we, may, we are looking at taking our uh, chats and moving them to Sunday because we notice Thursdays are just not good for a lot of people. So we're thinking about looking them, doing them on Sunday afternoon, early afternoon, because uh, we do have our life waves on Sunday evening, and uh, and of course that's another way to support the work we yes, do the life and wave help X39. yourself tremendously. Right, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. such a tremendous help! Big support for me in my struggles. Yes, I uh, can't live without my patch. Yeah, so, yes, so. Uh, it's on our website. We'll have the information. Can... Yeah, it's on our web. Everything's on our website now, thanks to my wife working with our, <laughs> with, with getting with Jamie, our webmaster, getting all that on there. So the different ways to support us are right there, and LifeWave is as well. Very easy. If you need help, uh, you can reach out to us. I'll have that information where you can email us on that subject separately. Uh, but like Yana said, if you have questions on and the support that you have about this, Israeli News Live at ProtonMail.com. Love to hear from you. Yes. Anyway, thank you. God bless you and have a great day.